statement is gonna take years. No need to trip on a funky query. Use my producing JavaScript with CouchDB. The schema listen replicates using JSON. Non-relational databases turn me on. From now on, I'll use CouchDB. Welcome to the Change Luck episode 0.5.4. I'm Adam Stachowiak. And I'm Wynn Nedelin. This is the Change Log. We cover what's fresh and new in the world of open source. If you found us on iTunes, we're also on the web at thechangelog.com. We're also up on GitHub. Head to github.com slash explore. You'll find some training repos, some feature repos from the blog, as well as our audio podcast. And if you're on Twitter, follow Change Log Show and me, Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P E N G W I N N. This episode is sponsored by GitHub Jobs. Head to thechangelog.com slash jobs to get started. If you'd like us to feature your job on this show, select Advertise on the Changelog when posting your job, and we will take care of the rest. The irony of a real radio station advertising on the fake radio, Southern California Public Radio, KPCC 89.3 on your FM dials, looking for a Django Python developer that would report into the senior UX designer and implement uh, HTML, CSS, the Python Django templates experience with the full stack MVC, MySQL plus if you're in the Pasadena, California area, be sure and check out lg.gd slash nine S fun episode this week. Took a break from our regularly scheduled design programs. Save, save your emails guys. We know two back to back design episodes set off the, uh, the switchboards, but we're back to the no sequel. Talk to Chris Anderson over at Couchbase about the Membase CouchDB merger and the full line of products that they have. Let me ask you a question. Did he have a brand new theme song then? You know, he sent it to me. We will put that in the show notes. Actually, if you can cut it into the intro, that would be awesome. We'll try. We'll do our best. If you guys haven't uh, caught the uh, the ad hoc uh, theme show uh, theme song uh, that we recorded the first time, uh, I guess the NoSQL Smackdown at South by last year. Uh, Chris was was awesome in that little dilly. Uh, it's uh, we had the video too, and he was bouncing around. So I don't think anybody got to see that though. Fun times with uh, Chris abound. We talked about what it's like to work with Damian Katz um, on the Apache project, and also his buddy Jan Leonard. Who, if you don't know Jan, then you're missing out. Yeah, absolutely. Fun episode. Should we get to it? Let's do it. We're chatting today with Chris Anderson from Couchbase. So, Chris, why don't you introduce yourself and your role over at Couchbase? Sure. Yeah, I've been a longtime committer to the Apache CouchDB project and founded a CouchDB company with Damian Katz and Jan Leonard uh, back in 2009. And we, you know, were a merry band of engineers, you know, doing everything we could to make CouchDB awesome. Um, and then, you know, in the uh, Last few months, we were, you know, kind of faced with the choice between doing a uh, another round of VC or uh, merging with these guys over at Membase. And as we started to look closer and closer at them, um, it got to be, you know, obvious that uh, it was just the right choice. So now we're couch base and we're bigger and stronger. And um, you know, me and Damien and Jan get to focus on our on the things we're good at. So yeah, it's a uh, been a wild ride and and i guess we're just getting started so well we'll get into couch base in just a moment so for the five or so people out there that aren't familiar with couch db why don't you give an, an overview of the apache couch db project sure so apache couch db is a database that's accessed via web protocols so you just store json in it and uh you know get json back both in the form of what you stored and then you can also build uh, dynamic queries so you know i want all the blog posts in the last you know, two days, that, that sort of thing is easy to pull out. Um, it's got some other fun features. The, the killer one that really uh, we're not seeing anywhere else in the marketplace is the ability to keep two copies, two or more copies of it all synchronized. So the idea, you know, kind of like Dropbox, but, um, you know, for your uh, API, not for your files. Um, so, you know, you've got two copies of it and, uh, you know, there's work going on on both ends and you can synchronize them. Uh, more or less effortlessly. So, you know, I can talk technically more about the, uh, um, you know, how that synchronization works. But, 
for most developers, it just works. So in reference to Couchbase, the new, uh, I guess, merger of, of Membase and, and CouchDB, how did that come about? And what's, uh, I guess, the offering from, from Couchbase now? Sure. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, it's part of our, our wild ride as, as founders. Um, so, you know, uh, what happened was Damien and I had a chance meeting with James, who is our, um, you know, lead product architect guy now. Um, and we just started talking and what they'd been doing for the last year, you know, it was kind of at the other end of the spectrum from what we'd been doing as far as, you know, where they're putting their focus and vice versa. And then comparing notes even more, our plans for 2000. 11 were to do what they'd already done and and vice versa they wanted to build into their product membase a lot of the features that CouchDB already has um so you know we started talking more and more and we realized that um at the end of the day doing this merger would accelerate both companies roadmaps and and there's one thing that you can't buy and that's time so so i really feel like um if it continues to go well on a technical front integrating stuff that we have jumped forward a year or maybe even two in terms of our roadmap and capabilities and, you know, viability as a company. So, um, you know, on top of that, it's a huge relief for me because I went from being the CFO to being the president and having to manage, you know, all these teams and stuff, which is great fun, but I'd much rather focus on, you know, where the rubber meets the road as far as what developers are using. So How many now CFOs I, I, do you know that actually have a GitHub account? <laughs> Well, there's a few of them, but you know that's what you do when you're when there's three of you. You got somebody's got to be the CFO, and um, I drew the short straw, I guess. So, you know, the first link on the Couch uh, Base website is why NoSQL. So it's now 2011. Um, not only are you having to answer this question, uh, you're featuring it prominently on your your homepage. Are you finding that you have to sell NoSQL just as much as you have to sell your products? Um, yeah. So. Uh, so it really depends on the audience that you're talking to. The core audience of this show probably already knows what NoSQL is for, and, and they're probably even over that hump where you know it seems like a threat to their you know tried and true relational databases. Um, I think most of the cutting edge developer community sees that there's problems that are just a better fit for schemaless storage, where you don't have to deal with migration, um, you know, migrating your schema all the time. Um, and then, of course, like once you go over that hump, then there's all kinds of other benefits like the synchronization that we offer um, or the ability to do scale out because of key value based architectures instead of uh, the relational model. Um, so, you know, at the cutting edge, I feel like that story is told. But, um, you know, the percentage of developers who even, you know, know what GitHub is is vanishingly small compared to the large mass people out there. Um, and so, yeah, to uh, they're, and they're going to come to us not because they heard about Couch, but because they heard, oh, there's something different, and you know, um, that little blurb may be the first explanation they get of NoSQL at all. So, what uh, does the product line look like for Couchbase? So, what names survive, or is it just a, a new name totally with Couchbase? Sure, that's a great question. Um, the answer is kind of it's easier to talk about it uh, from the technical side because. What we're doing for integration is fairly obvious. I mean, that's a big part of why the merger looked viable. After after it looked exciting, then of course we had to go, um, you know, look at it with a skeptical eye and see is it going to be too hard to pull off. Um, but it's really technically kind of obvious what we've got to do. Um, so before you understand what our combined product is going to look like, you've got to understand Membase, which um, you know the elevator pitch is. It's basically a big Memcached yeah. cluster that doesn't you know, forget everything when the power goes out. So it handles the, the um, you know, resizing the cluster, and it handles, if you want it to, um, proxying, you know, each request to the particular cluster member, or if you use smart clients, then you can, you know, have a slightly better efficiency. Um, but, but overall, you know, it'll do all the rebalancing and make sure that uh, as your data set grows, you can maintain sub-millisecond query latencies um, via the, the MIM-capable API. So that's uh, that's Membase, and um, currently today the backend storage is handled by uh, SQLite. So, um, but they're not using the relational features of SQLite; they're basically using it instead of raw files. Um, so the first step, pretty obvious to do, is just pull out SQLite and replace it with CouchDB storage engine. 
Um, and so that's easier even than it sounds because most of Membase, the, um, you know, everything but the critical write path pretty much is written in Erlang already. Um, and then there's the C-based, you know, Memcached and SQLite portions. But um, this is just going to be, you know, placing a bigger bet on Erlang. And it also makes it really smooth to integrate Couch. Um, so first step is just, just getting Couch in there as a storage engine. And we're going to release that product um, as essentially something that, that provides a lot of value to existing Membase users because you get, you know, for the one thing, slightly better I.O. throughput to disk. Um, Couch is just more optimized for the kinds of access patterns that Membase was already doing. Um, and so that's, you know, just kind of like a, a really basic win, but maybe not worth all the technical risk of trying to do this integration on its own. Um, the other thing you get more or less for free is the ability to query now um, your your memcached uh, your membase cluster with the CouchDB style MapReduce. So that's always been a big thing that's been missing from people's memcached experience, right? You stick stuff in, you can get it out by the same key you put it in, but as soon as you want to get more complex than that, then you're uh, you know you're either having to do a bunch of uh, pointer following in your application or you're having to write some custom layer uh, that interacts with Memcached. So this will give people a, a straightforward ability to get real-time um, you know, queries on top of their Memcached clusters or, or Membase clusters. And, um, and that alone is enough to be pretty exciting, but that's, that's really just the first step. You know, once you go down the path of choosing a NoSQL option, and there's a whole lot of options out there, we've covered a lot of them, on the show, I think where Couch in the past has shined has been in the uh, the replication area. But you got another uh, kind of ace in the hole, as it were, uh, coming up. Talk about your mobile. Yeah, well, so so, um, so yeah, so mobile is um, been a focus of you know Couch One before the merger, and uh, even though we've got more going on after the merger, I think that we're getting more momentum on mobile. If only because I'm not dealing with you know HR and fundraising, I'm I'm working on mobile, um, and uh, and for the most part, that's just been coordinating a lot of the code that we had, um, you know, around and and starting some QA and some release process on it and documenting it and getting it out to the community. Um, so I'm really lucky to our engineers for having already you know kicked a bunch of ass on uh, getting stuff to run on iOS. It's not. Um, it's it's not real simple. We had to do a lot of um, low level stuff to the Erlang VM, um, to CouchDB itself, and um, you know. But the upshot is now we've got a CouchDB instance that runs on your device. Um, we were surprised to find that it's just has almost no impact on battery life. So that was that was real lucky. Um, I mean, it's it's not surprising when you understand Erlang and and you know how Erlang is good at being idle. Um, but still, we were expecting to have to invest a lot there. Instead, we've still got to tackle the overall download size. So right now, it adds about 15 megabytes to your application, um, which we see being fine for enterprise applications and kind of more serious stuff. But if somebody just wants a little bit of synchronization, that, that's big enough to make them think twice. So our first goal is to shrink that. So I guess on iOS, which every app's in its own little sandbox, that's pretty much additive to every app that you create. You can't install the Couchbase framework once and then share that, right? Right, yeah, and that's um, down to the Apple restrictions, which I think make perfect sense. I mean, they're, they're sandboxing these apps. They don't want, you know, some, they don't want DLL hell. They don't want your, your you know, underlying libraries swapping versions out from underneath your application. So, um, yeah, we just, you know, it's our job to get that thing small enough to not have that negative impact. And I think five megabytes is uh, the threshold where we can start to feel so why, uh, pretty strong about it. Why iOS first? Was it a, an install base decision or lower barrier to entry as far as a technical problem? Well, we've been running on Android for, I don't know, about nine months now. Um, and the, you know, the response has been really strong. We've got a couple of case studies in the pipeline of people who are using Android on the device or using Couch to be on their Android device. Um, and it's, uh, it, but it was actually kind of scary because Android affords you so much freedom. Um, you know, that whole, that question you're asking about, is it in each app or is it once on the device um, on Android, you can have CouchDB be a library. And so there's this whole line of development going down about how to manage a centralized database that multiple applications are talking to. It's really powerful and interesting and, and like threatened to, um, you know, pull us into the rabbit hole, um, with iOS, with the different restrictions, you know, it's, uh, Paul Graham said this once, he said, uh, you know, 
when you're when you're a startup find the you know the run up the steepest hill you can find just do do the hardest thing that you can see because probably most people aren't looking with the same amount of detail as as what you're looking at so if you see something really challenging and you can um, nail it first then that gives you a really strong position so we think that uh, that a win on iOS is going to be easier to translate to other platforms and vice versa so one of the attractive features of Couch in the past has been these Couch apps, right? And it's it's more of a move back to client server where you've got your views and, and uh, presentation logic actually running in your database, so to speak. Is that the same sort of pattern that you follow with a mobile application? Um, you know, sort of. Uh, in, in the sense that Couch apps are uh, the least amount of you know, stuff you've got to do aside from the thing that runs in your browser that you're already good at. I mean, imagining, you know, like a, a jQuery developer um, and they want, they're used to having to deal with the Sinatra guy or the Node.js guy to do the server component and provide them a JSON API for the front end. Um, you know, a Couch app is just um, simplifying that stack so that the jQuery developer doesn't need to deal with the middle tier anymore. Um, but if we are going to take that same philosophy and apply it to iOS, then you know, really the, the right approach is to be as transparent to your traditional iOS developer as possible, be the least amount of additional stuff they have to learn. So out of the gate, it's just CouchDB with the HTTP JSON API, but we see uh, some APIs that Apple's got that should allow us to have a pure core data interface. So you know, ideally, existing apps that already use core data you just plug our library in and get the synchronization for free. Um, that's the goal, and hopefully we can get there. But you know, even if there's roadblocks, we've still got something I think is pretty valuable. So on your uh, product page, you've got one of these nice manager-friendly uh, diagrams that just has the word couch sync between couch base and, and the mobile app. Is that replication, or how's that working? Yeah, that's replication. Um, and so you know, plain old replication is just so easy to do in couch. You, you post some JSON via HTTP at the server and, you know, tell it the remote server that you want it synchronized with and it does the rest of the work and does it as bandwidth efficient as possible. Um, and you can even tell it to continuously keep up to date, um, which, you know, that even turns out to be a good fit for mobile networks. Uh, that long pole or, you know, continuous changes feed connection um, is actually, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was going to run counter to the way cell networks work, but they're already optimized for these kind of long running, mostly quiet connections. Um, so that was that was nice. Um, so basic replication uh, is a really good fit for mobile, but there are some um, some patterns that we want to embody in in CouchSync um, that you know make to make things easier. So for instance, uh, on the MemBase side, one of the big users is Zynga. So you can imagine all the data in Farmville, and right now it's in a big cluster. Um, but if you want to take Farmville and make it offline capable, then you'd need to have the ability to get the data for uh, you know a single given user and put it in its own little uh, database, you know, essentially, so that the user can then replicate that back and forth um, for their backup slash offline. Um, so you know, tools to make that stuff super easy. That's that's what's out on the horizon for us. Let's talk about couch apps for a moment. Did you coin this term? Um, I guess so. I mean, it's kind of obvious, you know, pretty much every couch term in the universe is taken at this point. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, yeah, the couch app script that's like sort of a developer toolkit, um, that you can find linked from couchapp.org, uh, implemented in Python. Now I originally wrote something in Ruby that did essentially the same thing and, uh, just didn't have time to do the maintenance burden. So I handed it off to, uh, Benoit, um, and Jan, both couch TV committers, and they, uh, you know, they worked on it some in Ruby, and then and then decided to port it py to Python because that's where Benoit is, you know, that's where he feels most comfortable. So now we've got this Python thing with, you know, all these, uh, you know, practically enterprisey features. You can like write eggs to plug into it, and I don't use any of that stuff, um, but it's good that it's there when you need it. Um, but you know, so that that's a developer tool chain, um, but it's different from the idea. The idea of a Couch app is just an app that is served out of CouchDB and to whatever the native client you have around is. The most popular native client in the world right now, of course, is the HTML browser. Um, but on iOS, if it's you know just Objective-C and CouchDB, um, that, that's, I'll call that a Couch app. Um, so, yeah, I think that it's, you know, the, the real fundamental idea is that 
if you are um, allowing your users to take a database offline onto their device, um, you've kind of got to understand the security model of the fact that they've got a copy of all the data. And so, you know, the place where you apply your security policy is going to be on that inbound replication stream. It's, it's not going to be, um, you know, by writing some middleware, uh, you know, Rails app or something that sits there and, and validates everything as it's going through. You know, one of the things that I noticed when I got into development was that uh, no matter you know, how good you were on the front end, unless you were you know, uber front end ninja, to use the term, um, you pretty much had to deal with a, a server implementation of some sort. And we were all kind of uh, in tribes based on whichever server platform you chose because you really couldn't afford to, to pick up more than one because it was you know, such an overhead of, of knowing more than one platform. But as uh, apps like uh, CouchDB and Node.js have taken off. It seems like we've kind of um, this JavaScript layer that all of us were familiar with. As we start to do more with it, we're, we're starting to kind of bleed or blur those lines in between our tribes. Have you noticed anything like that? Well, absolutely. I mean, especially, you know, talking about the cutting edge developers who have the choice to use the tools they want. Um, you know, JavaScript seems to be really taking off. And I think that's the reason is, um, you know, why I switch all those contexts when JavaScript has, you know, most of the runtime benefits that the other languages can give you. But on the other hand, you do have a bunch of developers, you know, off in the enterprise world who don't get to pick what they use. However, that's even changing. I mean, JavaScript in the browser has been common there for a long time. So maybe we can leapfrog. Um, people can move, you know, straight from their, um, you know, VB.net backends to uh, Couch apps. And we've heard stories of, you know, uh, large internal um you know, customer management systems and stuff being moved over to couch and getting, you know, much better. Basically less code means less, less to maintain. And also, um, a lot of these guys have been seeing better performance just because you, you know, you don't have a Java stack trace, you know, 50 frames deep or whatever. You know, one of the things that intrigues me about couch is, um, not only does it collapse a lot of the middle layers, which, uh, seem to be superfluous for a lot of uh, the smaller end apps, but also it's built in versioning for everything, not just your data, but you're also your GUI. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's got, so it's important to distinguish uh, CouchDB's, uh, you know, the, the built in versioning, as it were, is multi version concurrency control. So what that means is if, you know, we're both working on the same, against the same cloud server, and you load the document, and I load the document, and then you make a change and save it. When I try to save it, um, Couch is going to, reject my save as being out of date. And that's just um, to prevent race conditions. But it also means that readers can always proceed against a view query or against, you know, scanning the documents in a database without being blocked by writers. Uh, everyone has, you know, their own independent snapshot of the database. So that's all, you know, goes really deep into the technical design of Couch uh, when you start to look at it. But the the thing to be clear on is that um, by default, those old versions do not get replicated around. So when you synchronize, it just sends you know the current version. Um, when you compact, which you know if, if you're not your own DBA, your DBA may compact when you least expect it um, to clean up wasted space. That'll also clean up the outdated versions. Um, that's not to say you can't do versioning in Couch. There's lots of applications that either do like a um, you know entity for you know have an entity document and then log uh, additional documents that re refer, you know, refer to that entity. Um, so you can do patterns like that, or you can do patterns like actually keeping the full history as uh, binary attachments on the, uh, on the old history. So there's a lot of patterns there to do. And it's, um, if you, if you Google, you know, CouchDB simple document versioning, I wrote a blog post about this a few months, it'll come up and it'll kind of go through the pros and cons of all the patterns. In an effort to keep it real, what sort of applications are not suited for CouchDB? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think that uh, you know a worst case scenario for what um, you know how much storage and resources uh, you're using up compared to uh, you know the the alternative, um, like a real time message queue where you don't care about archiving it. So you know some kind of something where you've got something that's you know fairly reliable but in memory. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, so if, if you, if you were going to do that workload in CouchDB, you'd have all the message history, you know, for that application stored on disk. 
Um, on the other hand, most real-time messaging applications do have some sort of need to archive and query the messages. I mean, maybe not most, but a fair proportion of them. So I've seen Couch used for spam filters. I've seen Couch um, you know, used for chat rooms. And it makes a good fit for that sort of stuff. Um, the you know, other ephemeral data, so if you were just doing like a dig style um, upvote counter on a post, uh, maybe you know maybe something else would be a better fit. Although we're addressing that, I think there is some some truth to be said that right now the different No SQLs have all been um, kind of finding their niche and, and getting entrenched there. But that that really everyone's going after some form of eighty percent solution. So people are going to be adding each other's feature sets to the extent that it makes sense technically. What was involved with getting uh, the Erlang runtime on iOS? Do you guys have to yeah. use that? Or? <laughs> um, our, our engineer, Aaron Miller, is, um, you know, gets most of the credit for that. So he went through the Erlang VM. You know, Erlang is implemented in C, um, and it uses dynamic linking for, you know, kind of a whole lot of it. You know, it's, it's basically uh, built out of its own plug-in system um, at some level. And so he went through and turned all that dynamic linking into static linking, which was just like, you know, touching a bunch of code. Um, and having to know what to do. And then there was a bunch of other, you know, strange little gotchas that you wouldn't expect. Um, but, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Erlang uses a, you know, uses the, the syscall fork to create a sub uh, sub process to handle DNS uh, lookups. And that's just not going to fly on iOS. You can't do fork. So we had to do, you know, little subtle changes like that. We also had to get um, SpiderMonkey running on the device. So we have JavaScript running in a background thread because the built-in JavaScript on iOS, um, at least to my knowledge, uh, always blocks the the main UI thread when it's running. So you can't have the UI locked up just because a MapReduce is generating. Um, so we included that spider monkey in there, which I think also had to have some some technical changes. But um, you know, mostly it was just a matter of getting the build cleaned up and and then going through and and um, conforming to you know, sort of Apple's view of the world. Was SpiderMonkey a holdover from a previous design decision or any uh, consideration for V8? Yeah, so we've done the SpiderMonkey V8 shootout, and SpiderMonkey wins. Um, and the reason why is because V8 is optimized for, um, you know, process launch time. You open a new tab, it needs to be responsive right away. Uh, SpiderMonkey has the JIT compiler, which, uh, you know, as it's running, especially with these map functions where you define the function once and then run 100,000 documents through it, uh, the JIT will get it up to, you know, faster than C in some places. So um, coupled with that, SpiderMonkey seems to use a little less memory than V8. Um, and, and you know, the startup time being not that important to us, uh, we find that SpiderMonkey is better for, at least on a big server install of Couch, you're going to get better throughput. Um, you know, that being said, on iOS, if we could somehow use the built-in Nitro or whatever, I mean, the, you know, number one constraint there is I wouldn't, you know, I'd rather not have to download all of SpiderMonkey to the device, even if it's a little slower. Um, so we're working on figuring out solutions there. So CouchDB is part of the Apache Foundation lineup. What is the licensing rundown on everything Couchbase these days? Um, so Couchbase right now, has uh, Membase, which is, I think, Apache licensed. Um, and then, uh, you know, Couchbase, which is our build of uh, CouchDB that includes uh, GeoCouch and some other little features and QA and stuff. Um, and that's Apache licensed as well. Um, as far as what the license is going to be on, you know, stuff uh, way down in the future, we're still figuring that out. Um, but you know the main the main consideration for me right now is I want to make sure that um, that we're contributing to the Apache CouchDB community. Um, you know, not just code, but that Apache CouchDB is where you know the the work the Erlang work you know that's appropriate um, where that ends up. You know, we we could have could have easily come out the gate and said, okay, we're just going to like you know fork CouchDB and try and build up a community around that fork. But I would much rather you know stay in the Apache CouchDB community. So on your comparison page, you compare yourself to um, Couchbase versus Cassandra and MongoDB. So we've had Reoc on the on the show twice. Any other uh, NoSQL options out there that you could draw a distinction to? Um, 
You know, I think that uh, it's real important that people understand that uh, CouchDB's MapReduce is is really different from all the others, um, and especially Hadoop. So Hadoop is, um, as far as I'm concerned, the, the big winner right now um, for you know, especially in the enterprise people, you know, doing something other than just using Oracle. Um, and uh, so you know, CouchDB MapReduce is incremental. And what that means is that if you, you know, have 10 million documents in a database and you define a, a view, then it takes some time to build that view the first time. Um, but queries against that index are almost instantaneous. And then on top of that, uh, CouchDB automatically keeps the index up to date as efficiently as possible just by recomputing um, based, on, based on changes. Um, whereas uh, Hadoop-style MapReduce, which is what you'll find in the other products for the most part, is um, it's a batch process. So you'll put a few gigabytes into HDFS and then define your query and run it on it and take the results of that query and maybe put them back into a database for um, you know, real-time viewing. So if you change you know, 20% of those inputs, then it's usually better in the Hadoop context to just rebuild the whole thing, um, which is fine. I mean, Hadoop obviously seems very popular, uh, but it's different from the kinds of MapReduce that would be useful to a company like Zynga wanting to support Farmville and having real-time results available you know, as they stream in. So in the mobile context, you mentioned long-running connections. Um, what's available with CouchDB on the desktop or the server? Sure. So we have a Couchbase uh, desktop for OSX that is a rev of CouchDBX, a project that Jan had been working on for a long time. Um, it's finally, you know, cleaned out some of the um, some of the annoyances and and stuff, and and really stripped it down to just being a, an icon in your menu bar that you know has a couch based server running there, and you can pop it open on port fifty nine eighty four, and uh, you know create documents and play around in futon. So that was, uh, I think, that's important for supporting developers on the server. Uh, that you know, we also have a couch based server uh, build for you know Linux and um, Windows, and we see actually you know starting to get some interest from the Windows uh, side of the world. But in the long run, you know everyone's asking us, what about scale up? What about scale out? Because currently Apache CouchDB is designed for a single node. The API is designed to scale up, but the actual implementation doesn't contain that. Uh, so that's what we're going for. I mean, you know, that's the point of this merger is that when we've got our combined product. It's going to be the big, fast CouchDB that everyone always wished for. So what becomes of Couch.io? Uh, that's just um, an old domain name that I've still got laying around. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we've got, uh, you know, the history of the company was we founded it as the, you know, the business entity being Relax Incorporated, which is kind of like uh, GitHub's logical awesome. Um, and then... Yeah, we had this couch.io domain name, which was cute, but it had usability issues. And that's, you know, just became obvious the more people that we talked to about it. Um, so that's why we switched to Couch One. And, um, you know, finally with the merger, uh, we were, we're, you know, Couch Base, kind of obvious coming out of Couch One and Membase. And uh, my cabbie in Austin last weekend, you know, could understand what I was saying right away. I said couch base and, you know, he wasn't like couch what, which happens when you say couch DB. Mm -hmm. So um, I was pretty happy about that. Uh, so we're, we're not allowed to entertain the idea of changing the company's name ever again. So what about couch in the cloud? Oh, so the, the couch uh, hosting that we have is uh, expanding. We've got... Um, well, we've just recently been going through some upgrade pains, you know, as everything does, but we've moved everyone's data onto EBS, so we're getting faster um, latency and, you know, better throughput on those boxes. Uh, Jason is, uh, Jason Smith is our guy in Thailand who handles most of the hosting, and he's also working on, you know, rolling out the, the paid options for hosting, so it's really going to be, um, you know, catering to professional users who are, you know, either storing mission critical data in there or want to use it as a, you know, development point in the cloud. So there's other services out there, Cloudant being one. Are you guys um, supporters of that uh, as, as far as paid commercial support or do you see them as a competitor long term? Um, well, long term, what we see is the more CouchDB companies, the better. 
Um, and so, you know, we love it that Cloudin's there. There's another company, um, I think they're still stealth, but they're actually working on a couch app marketplace. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's a fair amount of, of action going on in the couch TV ecosystem. And, and, you know, we think the more diversity, the better. So, uh, Cloudin has big couch, which is, uh, sort of the, you know, it's it's a couch DB that scales out and it's all written in Erlang and is fairly performant and high throughput and we think that's great to have out there have people using it. Um, it's a little or at least uh, their you know their business model, uh, excuse me, uh, Cloudin's business model is a little more focused on you know kind of these real time search workloads. So they've got a lot of customers who are consuming you know, the Twitter Firehose or you know other feeds like that and doing semantic analysis and stuff on top of their um, on top of that data, we're a lot more interested in the, um, you know, real time, somebody clicked to buy a cabbage and now they have a cabbage, <laughs> those kind of queries. Um, so, you know, we think that there's room uh, easily for Cloudant and Couchbase and hopefully a whole slew of other companies to come along. So for the uh, developer that's not doing just front end, back end, uh, direct JavaScript to Couch, type uh, application architecture, um, where are you seeing the, the growth and the adoption in Python, Ruby? What sorts of communities are embracing Couch? So we're going right now uh, to focus on PHP first um, because, you know, uh, the runtime already makes a lot of sense with, you know, Couch's um, ability to crash and recover quickly. The PHP runtime, every single request is isolated. Uh, so if you have, you know, if what you need to do is turn some JSON into some HTML, uh, you could do worse than to turn to PHP. Um, but on the other hand, they need um, there's some work that needs to be done there to make the clients uh, really you know really smart and strong. So we're plowing energy into the PHP drivers, um, also into Ruby and Python um, and and Java and .NET. So it's actually Jan who's heading up the effort to put our SDKs together for the various platforms and. And picking which ones to do first, and and maybe maybe we're picking to start with PHP because uh, Jan's an old time PHP guy. Uh, don't don't tell anyone, but he's got a, a PHP.net uh, email address. <laughs> nice. So let's switch gears for a moment. Uh, when you're not hacking on couch or couch apps, what's really got you excited in the world of open source? Oh gosh, um, that's a good question. I've been I've been so heads down. Uh, first of all, you know I've. Uh, on the merger and now finally getting back to write code. But, um, you know, I think that the mobile stuff, iOS, uh, Erlang, I mean, I'm sorry, I, iOS and Android are, uh, really kind of, they're, they're, they're still going to surprise us. Um, people are making fun of that color funding, you know, they raised like 40 something million dollars, um, which is maybe more money than, uh, seems reasonable, but, their app seems kind of cool. I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know about the the financial side of it, but I think that uh, this kind of finding people who are near you um, in real time stuff is, uh, you know, hasn't even started to change the world yet compared to how it's going to. Um, I'll tell you I what, I'd like to an, see. Uh, I'd yeah, like, yeah. I'd like to see uh, the new Couchbase Mobile be a module for Titanium Accelerator, so that you've got or Accelerator Titanium Mobile, so that you've got. Uh, CouchDB option on both iOS and Android one day. Yeah, so we know of at least a few apps out there that are using Titanium and CouchDB together. I'm not sure if the code is open source or you know re- clean enough to turn into a module, but people are doing it, so it seems like it's a good fit. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm uh, doing what I can, meeting with you know all these uh, various HTML5 kind of UI and uh, widget component companies and you know jQuery Mobile and and delving into all that. Uh, if, if people are out there and are kind of interested in the intersection between um, front end and mobile, there's a seven part series uh, by this guy, Todd Anderson, on jQuery Mobile and CouchDB. And if you go through that seven part series, you'll come out the other end of it uh, probably better at that stuff than I am right now. I mean, it's, it's just got everything you need to know. Um, you know, so a week from now, you could be an expert iOS CouchDB developer or, or you know, HTML5 mobile uh, CouchDB developer. Todd Anderson, no relation? Nope, no relation. <laughs> um, but, uh, well, not that we know of yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, one last question. Who's your programming hero? 
Oh, you know, that's kind of easy because because um, I get to hang out with him on a fair basis uh, at the risk of being a fanboy. Uh, Damien, Damien's pretty awesome. I mean, um, as far as knowing what not to do, he's always coming to me saying like, Chris, are you sure you want to write that code? You know, if you write that code, someone's going to have to maintain it. And that's like having somebody be that conscience um, to not always add features is, um, you know, is, is really cool. And then, and then being able to see how stuff at the low level affects stuff at the high level. Um, the one story that, you know, he tells about Erlang that is, you know, really true. Um, I saw some, some performance benchmarks of some, um, what was it, a, an image converter that someone had written in Erlang, which seems unlikely to be fast, but it was. So each Erlang process, which is, you know, an Erlang process is kind of similar to a Java object. You can create 100,000 100, of them in a second, and you can, um, you know, and, and they're all running concurrently, scheduled by the scheduler. So each one of those has its own isolated stack and its own isolated heap. And that means that when one gets swapped onto a core, the whole thing gets swapped onto the core. And, you know, maybe it doesn't all fit right there on the L1 cache, but over the, you know, over the cache hierarchy, the active memory is all just localized um, as opposed to threaded concurrent code, which has to jump, you know, randomly across memory access all the time, potentially. So you've got these, you know, little processes that get swapped in, they burn through their workload, and then they get swapped out for another one. Um, and then on top of that, since they're isolated, they can be garbage collected independently. Um, and that means, you know, you don't have any stop the world pauses when the garbage collector is running. And if a process is done, you can just throw it out. You don't even have to crawl its heap. So those things combined together, you know, this is the sort of stuff that Damien explains to me and then I get all excited about. Um, <laughs> but I've seen uh, Erlang apps where, you know, you, you dial up the benchmark on it after it's, um, you know, after it's sort of prototyped. And you look at it and you go, this isn't going to work. This is just, you know, we're like two orders of magnitude outside of spec here. Um, but that's only with, you know, 50% load uh, applied. So then you do, you know, a couple of optimizations and, and you're getting better, but it still doesn't look great. And then you go crank the load up all the way, you know, actually get more than one um, box that's not the server box to apply load with instead of just, you know, AB running on one box or something. Um, really saturate it and... Uh, this the thread or the process scheduler can do these optimizations it can't do when it's less busy and so you end up getting kind of this better uh better than linear ringing out you know the last bit, bits of performance from the box and just any kind of language that can do that as uh, i don't know awesome and and it's even more fun when damien comes along and tells you why that happened you know, one of the things that struck me about damien when i first discovered uh, couch tv was just the story behind the project and how he basically uh, punted on his corporate career that was just not satisfying him to to follow an open source project which he didn't even know what it was at the time yeah um i mean that's that's uh, if people want to see that story the best uh the best resources he did a uh, or infoq has the video posted from the talk he did at ruby fringe uh back in i think uh 2009 maybe it was 2008 but yeah back at the ruby fringe conference in toronto um yeah, he got a, st a standing ovation for that talk, and you know, I think he tears up in the middle, so it's worth watching. Definitely put that in the show notes. One last question for you as a bonus. So I had the opportunity to be on the NoSQL Smackdown with your buddy Jan. I think you made an appearance in that one as well. So what's it like uh, working with Jan? Is he half as passionate in his day-to-day -day job as he was on that, that panel? Oh, yeah, he definitely is. He's the guy who... Um, you know, there will be a meeting and, you know, someone will say something and, and I'll, I'll be like, oh, I don't know about that, but it doesn't, you know, not enough to like actually speak up because I've got whatever, whatever else on my mind. And, and y'all will just jump right in and, and um, you know, get to the bottom of whatever the issue is. Um, and so, you know, it takes it takes you a minute to get uh, used to that, but then you start to thank him for it. That's, you know, it's important to have people who are really looking out for, um, you know, especially looking out for end users and developers and, you know, making sure that it takes the least amount of clicks to get to the download and all that. Well, Chris, certainly appreciate the time and uh, taking the time out of a busy schedule after the, the merger here to tell us about the new lineup and uh, where you're headed. Yeah, thanks, Wynn. Um, glad to be here. And, and uh, anybody who's, you know, getting started with Couch and gets uh, stuck or whatever, you know, has questions. Um, the community really loves helping new people. So even if you just, you know, tweet about your, uh, oh, I wrote this MapReduce 
you know, at CouchDB. You'll probably get some helpful replies. Cool. Thanks again.